this class so that we have the information that can be used later on. I'm going to share my screen as well. So I think I spoke about this book before. This is a book um, written by the chief examiner, Ms. Glenda Gay. She's the one who instructs the teachers on marking the exam. And in so many regards, a lot of the questions too, she set the questions on the CXA IT exam, but I guess there's a, there are, there's a panel of people who help with that. All right, and she spent the time to outline from day one, the structure, let me open this up so we can highlight where I'm referring to. The structure of how the exam is, you know, paper one being hour and 15 minutes, with 15 theory questions, 15 questions on productivity tools, that's like Word, Excel, Access, stuff like that, and 10 questions on problem solving. The long paper, the two hour paper, 35 questions on theory, the same amount as in the multiple choice paper. And know the amount of questions for productivity tools in terms of points, not amount of questions, but points allocated is 30 marks, that doubles. So your SBA is important here again, because as you can see, these are SBA areas, same Excel word, I don't know, database stuff. And the programming area, actually more than doubles rather than 10 marks it's now 25 marks so this is what you guys are going to have to deal with next month paper one multiple choice and paper two it's good to read the book because you get a good idea of what she's thinking what she expects on the exam seeing that she wrote the book and she's the person also going to give you the questions for the exam and it says end of chapter exam style questions at the end of every chapter. And I've found this to be true. A lot of the questions that I've seen on exams are here in the book. So one could also expect that questions that are not yet appearing on exams might also be previewed in the book. Who knows, are pretty similar. So it's good to read through the book. We're going to be doing chapter one, chapter two, chapter one, fundamentals of hardware and software. Chapter two, information processing. Chapter three, computer networks and web technologies. And chapter four, implications of misuse and cybersecurity. So those are the four chapters we're going to be doing. So chapter one is going to be done tonight, a long chapter from page six up to about page 36, about 30 pages of content. And some of it you already know. We're going to discuss it and go through it at a rather rapid pace because we have the book here to use. So the normal protocol would be, you know, chapter two is coming next week. So can I read through chapter two? So you come to each class with questions of what you don't understand, any misconceptions, so we can actually go through it together. All right. So let's get cracking on chapter one. This is pretty basic. A lot of it you'd already know. Let me zoom this up a bit. All right. You'd already know. All right, so like as per usual, it's a computer test. So the first thing they're going to deal with is computer by definition. The basic idea of what a computer is. So computers are an important aspect of information technology. As a matter of fact, computers make information technology possible, right? Because a computer is really designed to handle information. All right, a computer is an electronic device operating under the control of instructions stored in its memory, whether on its own or connected via a network, such as the internet, all right? So here are some of the characteristics of a computer that you need to pay attention to. Its ability to accept data, input data, put data into the computer. Manipulate, which means process. Manipulating and processing basically means adding, subtracting, multiply, divide. Those are the basic comes you want to pay attention to when it comes to processing. Produce results, giving output. Whenever you do something on a calculator or on a phone or whatever, you expect it to show you the results. Even if you go searching for a name, it must show you which name you're searching for. Putting out a number, see the name show up. Everything that is done, it is expected to show you results. These annoying bikes, I tell you. All right. 
also the store information. You store information as whether phone numbers, email addresses, pictures, video recordings, whatever. It must be able to store data. So a, fo a, 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 a phone is a computer, a calculator is a computer, a laptop, a tablet, the desktop computers, like you said, the lab, computers at uh, um, office or so on. All of those are computers. Now, let me give you from my um, summary of notes that's also available to you in your Google Classroom. The short, succinct definition of a computer, basically one sentence. Computers are electronic machines that input data, process, store, and output information, as well as communicate with light devices. And that one is left to last because a computer doesn't have to communicate with other devices of its kind. Some will, some might not. So the last one is option, optional, communicating with light devices. But what is sure is that a computer must be electronic. It must allow you to accept, to put data into it. That's accepting data input. It must also allow you to store, process, and output such data. All right? That is what a computer is. So any device at all you can think of, any machine that does these things, input, output, process, store, and it must be electronic, that is a computer. If it's even a watch, it's a computer. It doesn't matter. All right. Clear on that so far? And seeing that Miss Preston was here last night, I'm really trusting that um, Miss Golden, Miss Renee, that you're going to be the one responding mainly tonight. Renee, are you there? Yes, sir. May I listen? Yeah, listen sound like you're asleep more than listen to like a big time. So <laughs> may I tell you? Like, yes, sir, like really like if I call your name, like those are you snoring on the phone, snoring on and on, on, snoring on your device. All right. So there's a there's a little term called IPOS that's good to be familiar with. Input, process, output, store. Here it is, input, process, output, store. That's called the IPOS cycle. That is what a computer does. So now you about IPOS cycle. Think of a computer. Input, process, output, store. That is what it is. All right, all devices. I'll go back at watch, phone, tablet, microwave, some stove, even an air conditioning unit smart TV, any of those things. Once electronic, it allows the put information or put data in. It can process that data. You know, there's timing to say, okay, then fine. Three minutes later, two minutes later, three hours later. It can store information like you put a popcorn in a, in a microwave. You push the pop the button for popcorn. It remembers, stores information as to how long you should heat the popcorn for, the kernels for, for the corns to pop, for it, you know, for the kernels to pop. And become popcorn, all of those things. That is what a computer does: input, process, output, store. And by the very nature of that, now we start to look at what are the hardware components, because the keyboard, the mouse, thumb drives, the monitor, the system unit, all of those are things we can touch, we can handle them, we can feel them. So that is what is called a hardware. Once you can touch it, once you can feel it, once you can throw it in a garbage bin, you can abuse it, that is hardware. The term software, however, sounds like it is the opposite of hardware. But of truth, it is not. Software are instructions. Those are programs. Those are instructions given to a computer so it can execute its tasks. So like what we're doing when you're writing stuff in Pascal or pseudocode, algorithms, those things give an idea of what programs are about, all right? Okay, so let's focus on the hardware part for a while. <sighs> okay, the four, the, 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 there are five of them to focus on and the five major ones. For example, process, the peak part of the IPOS cycle, the process, that is done by the CPU. The CPU is called central processing unit. That is where most of the processing occurs 
or where all data has to go through to be processed. But the CPU, it is absolutely necessary. It's the brain of the computer. The computer can't function without it. Imagine yourself trying to function without your brain. It doesn't work. All right, so the CPU, that is what we call the central, the main area, the brain of the computer, the part that the computer absolutely needs to process. Let me open something else here. Let me try to keep consistent with like what I did last night. There are other areas of the computer that process as well. You have the CPU, I have another one called GPU for some computers. These are merely high-end gaming machines. And this part is called um, graphics um, processing unit. This one is called um, central, oops, processing unit. All right, so the central processing unit, that is where all the data has to go through to be processed. When I go to the, C, when I go to the CPU, the CPU decided there's a part of the CPU, the CPU called the control unit. The control unit directs the flow of information saying that, okay, this bit of data coming through, it's video related. So send that to the GPU so it's gonna be processed and put to the monitor or the screen. This bit of data coming through is sound. So send this to the sound card area so it can be processed and come out to the speaker so the person can hear or it is something relating to, let us say, something the user want to print. So this data can be, can be processed differently in a different area and sent to the printer to come out on paper. So the CPU is broken into two areas. The control unit directs the flow of data through the computer, decides what should go where to be processed sometimes. The CPU might also do some processing itself, all right? And that, when it does the processing itself, that's done in the ALU, the arithmetic logic unit. And that area now is where this is done in the CPU. Let me do this. Um, the arithmetic part deals with the, the subtraction, the addition, the division, and the multiplication. That's what the arithmetic part deals with those four operations. The logic part deals with less than, um, greater than, sorry, greater than, comma, equal to, oops, as well as not equal to. So all of those different things we call logic operators. Why we call them logic operators? Because if you have something to do, let's just say, for example, you have four um, greater than five. There's only one output you can get. All right, this is a true or a false. So if you're comparing two numbers, four greater than five, the answer is false. Four is not greater than five. If on the other hand, you come here and you say four times five, you get something totally different. You get 20. So this is actually a process, a mathematical operation is saying that add five four times or add four five times, whichever one you want to take it as, all right? So this is actually carrying out a process, the arithmetic part. The logic part of it is comparing. Is this the same as this or is it not equal to stuff like that, all right? So the arithmetic logic unit carries out arithmetic as in mathematical operations as well as logical operations. That's what really what it does, all right? Um, input devices. An input device really gets data into the computer. That's the simplest way of looking at it. An input device is a machine. It gets data into the computer. So any device that you can use to get data into the computer is an input device. Right now, I'm using my microphone to get data into the computer. That's an input device. If you're typing a letter, the keyboard is the input device. The keystrokes on the, key, on, the, on the keyboard that you're tapping that gets a letter into the computer. If you're using a camera to record videos or take pictures, that is what you use to get the data, the images, whether still pictures or motion pictures into the computer. That is the input device, all right? There's a term here that is oftentimes handled to called input, input and input device. Let me clarify that up a bit. Uh, let me clarify a bit. Where is this again? 
I paused it already? Yeah, I paused it that long time. Oh, wait a second, no. Mm, supercomputers, yeah. Input, all right? So, and, so input really speaks toward the data you're putting into the computer, all right? Hold a second, a noisy vehicle passing again. All right, so input really speaks to the data you're putting into the computer. So right now my voice is going into the computer, that's the input, all right? If you're taking a picture, the image that you're capturing, that is the input. The camera capturing the image, that is the input device. The microphone capturing the sound of my voice, that is the input device. So the device or the machine is separate from the input. The device is what actually captures the data and send that into the computer. The input is the actual data. All right. So want to make that clear. We're clear, Ms. Golding, with that? Are you still there? Are you, are you positive already? <laughs> there, man. <laughs> You're there? All right, let me just say a while ago. Yeah, sir. Yeah. You hear me? Let me just say a while ago. Yeah. So Come on, Ms. Golding. I want to say that I'm sleeping. Get data huh? into the computer. Input device gets data into the computer. All right, fine. I remember what, what I said input is as opposed to input device, right? Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, so you say. All right. So input is the actual data you're putting in, and the input device is what captures the data to put it into the computer. There's another definition for input device as well that meaning it converts data from human readable to machine readable this means that we're looking at this and we're seeing a set of letters and numbers words that we can read when the computer reads this all these things it's seeing is ones and zeros one zero zero one zero zero something and all kind of stuff ones and zeros that's all the computer is seeing that's machine readable stuff all right so that is what the computer considered that is what is considered to be machine readable data ones and zeros we are seeing words and letters that's human readable all right cool so that's what an input device does converts data from human readable to machine readable as well as put data into the computer it will also help to control or direct the computer as well especially when you are playing games and so on all right. Um, continuing. Open devices, those are the opposite of input devices. All right. An open device simply gets data out of the computer. If you put it in, you're going to want it later. So the open device gets the data out of the computer. So in other words, it converts it from machine readable back to human readable form because machine readable data doesn't make any sense to us. All right. That don't work. All right, memory. Memory deals with storing data, but really storing data in two types, ROM and RAM. That's really what memory deals with, ROM and RAM. Because memory is what the CPU uses. All right, we don't use memory. The CPU uses memory, ROM and RAM, all right? Storage media is what we use. Thumb drives, hard drives, CDs, DVDs, anything like those that we put our personal data on or any files that we want to use, transmit from computer to computer, all right? So anything that we use like CD-ROMs, DVDs, thumb drives, SD cards, anything like that, those are tapes because you go to a movie theater, they still store movies and tapes, those big reels to watch a movie, all right? It stores the movie and those. So all of those things are what we call storage devices, all right? The term peripheral device comes because this is not something that's located inside the CPU or inside the system unit. What you do is plug this onto the computer to get added functionality, like a camera, a keyboard, a mouse, monitor, all of those are considered peripheral devices. I don't agree with it. The truth, I don't agree with it. But that is what the book says. There are several things the book says that I don't agree with, but we work with it because she has set the exam and she was also instrumental in setting the syllabus as well. All right? 
So we work with that. All right. So peripheral devices, anything you can plug onto a computer scanner, a microphone, barcode reader, anything you plug onto a computer for added functionality. Give the computer some more features, do some additional tasks. All right. Software, as we already spoke about, software really is the instructions that we give to a computer so the computer can know how to get that particular task done. The software is like the intelligence of the computer. As soon as you load in the program, the computer now no, no knows how to get this task done because the software is telling it how to do it. As soon as you load WhatsApp, the computer knows, knows how to use WhatsApp. So can you use it? Want to go Instagram? The computer knows how to work with Instagram as soon as they install the app. Because the app or the program is telling the computer, the CPU, how to process data to get this done. All right? There's a term here called information and communication technology. I kind of hit on this last night, but I don't want to do it. Why? Because this is a topic, and I made it on mine. I'm going to do this tonight. I'm going to really get into this. Um, maybe tomorrow night, not so tomorrow night, next week or the following week, whenever it is that we're going to be doing networks is the best time to do this topic. All right, because we can deal with it in depth. I just don't want to touch anything on the surface. We can deal with it in depth at that point in time. Information and communication technology. All right. Computer, computer software also on our programs come in different types. You have system software, it's like Windows and Android. They run the whole computer. They allow the whole computer to function. Without this software, system software, or operating system, whatever it's called, system software, or operating system, the computer can't function. It won't even turn on. That's what system software do. It allows the computer function to function properly by controlling all the hardware. And by hardware, I mean the mouse, the keyboard, the memory inside of it, the hard drive, the CPU, all of those things. It controls all of them so that it can work together so the computer can function properly as a system software manages. Utility software, which the, the, the book says is a part of system software. Again, I don't agree with that, but the book says that something I work with it. Utility software, those maintain the health of your computer. They help your computer to be, remain healthy. It's like antivirus programs that prevent the computer from catching a virus. Because a virus really is a program that is written, that is designed to damage your computer because it's a malfunction. So utility software help to keep your computer healthy. They use encryption programs as well to keep your data safe. Backup programs so you can actually have multiple copies of files. So in case something happens, you can actually use the backup if you lose your data. Um, firewall programs to prevent persons from getting onto your computer by secure, like, like acting like a security guard. Um, you know, like when they come into a compound, like with a hotel or, or a bank or so at the door, prevent suspicious programs or persons from getting onto your device or even programs for getting off because it won't allow certain programs to get off because it doesn't have permission. All right? So those programs, firewall programs and so on, those are the programs that we call firewall programs. They're all utility programs. We'll get into those more when it comes to data security and data integrity. All right? We'll get into that more. All right? So that's, that's utility software. Application software now speaks to basically five categories that we're going to deal with later on in the, in the, in the chapter. But application software really speaks toward software or programs that help us to accomplish tasks, get our job done, our work done. That is what it does. Application software, applied tasks. Okay? These areas now are in-chapter questions. These areas is what we want to look at next class. So we're going to read the chapter um, after the end of class today. You can read through it between now and next class. Go through it again. Next class begins with answering all these in-chapter questions. It might take up the whole class time. Who knows? But we're going to go through all of these in-chapter questions and discuss them before we move on to chapter two. 
as well as the end chapter question, the, the end of chapter questions. All right. So we're gonna look at input devices and media. So input devices, any remember, any hardware device that you can use to get data into a computer. That's all it really does. All right. And these are several many types. You have, it's divided into two categories, manual input device, the first one, device that you have to actually control the device and put the data in. Like for example, a keyboard or a keypad. A keyboard is, keyboard is a full length keyboard where you have all letters of alphabet on it, the number pad, all of those different areas. Or a keypad only has a few letters or a few numbers, all right? The keypad is a kind of short form. You find them at point of sale machines or ATM, all of the various things. All right. So that's a keypad, a kind of short form of a keyboard. All right. A mouse without a mouse is an object that rolls on the desk, controls a point on the screen. All right. You also have touch sensitive devices, touch screen, you have document scanners, like a regular scanner, put a paper on, and then it, the light passes through it. And then you are able to edit that same document on your laptop or on your device. All right, it converts the hard copy to electronic document, soft copy. All right, a microphone, we all know what that does. That really hard makes sense discussing. Digitizer is like a light pen that allows you to draw, like almost like a stylus, but it's it's deeper than that, but it's hard to describe because if you've ever really seen one in operation, it's gonna be difficult to explain, all right? And so on, but a digitizer is something similar to like a stylus or a light pen, all right? Um, touchpad. You find those on all laptops, basically, or most laptops. The flat rectangular area that you touch and move your finger across to control the point on the screen. You have pointing devices, again, like light pen. You have joysticks as well. You have a mouse. You have a, look at again, trackball. All of those are pointing devices. Some remote controls are pointing devices as well. All right, and so on. All right, some of those are um pointing devices and you have a barcode reader we're well, not barcode reader. scan the barcodes and products at supermarkets and so on all right you have biometric systems use mainly for identification you know by capturing unique human features like retina scan that's your eye or iris still eyes facial recognition software that really captures how far apart your eyes, your nose, how the measurements between them to identify someone, even your ears and so on, and the general shape of it. So that is what it does. All right, that's what facial recognition software does. All right, so biometric systems capture unique human traits, normally for identification purposes. All right, those are manual input devices. Now we get into direct data entry devices. Some of these I think should be direct data entry as well, like a barcode reader, but they are not classified there. So direct data entry devices where now you will use the machine to actually capture the data, all right? Um, it's right here, direct data entry devices. Later on, you're gonna, you're gonna see why I said that because in the table below, I think, even though it says barcode reader here, I think a barcode reader in the table below is actually in the manual um, entry input devices. Smart card readers, optical, optical mark readers, those are where you do shading, like bubble sheet, bubble sheets. So you can actually mark your multiple choice papers, like what you're going to do soon. All right. Um, another like magnetic ink character readers, scanners, again. All right, um, sensors. Those are like light sensors that when you pass by someone's house, a light comes on or a pressure sensor when you sit in a seat. 
in a car, the seat belts sign comes on telling you to or, or, or noise chiming off, telling you to buckle your seat belt, those kind of things. All right, those are sensors or temperature sensor. Temperature goes up too much. The sprinklers come on in your house, like a smoke detector, or the radiator fan comes on in the car to help cool the engine. There are many different applications of sensors or lights come on, like street lights, because the photo cell is no longer detecting any light. So the street lights come on because it assumes it's dark. All right. Magnetic ink character readers, these are devices used to validate checks at a bank. All right. So here's a table below now that really gets into the nitty gritty of the different input devices, what they're used to do, the advantage and disadvantages. It's good to read through it, but the truth is much of this does not come on exam, like one or two marks, all right? And again, direct data entry devices, barcode readers and so on. Let me look and see if it was listed up here. Um, keyboard, no, right. Okay, barcode reader was only listed under, under, under direct data entry devices. I thought for a minute they was listed under both. But OCR, a scanner, it was listed, maybe that one, yeah. Here's a scanner. This is what I was just there. Scanner, used to capture an image. But here it is down here. So again, it's under both areas. And the truth is, scanners, uh, to me, a scanner really is a direct data entry device. Should not be under manual data entry, but I guess is what the persons who did their research decided to put on the, on, in the book. So I'm not going to debate it with them. All right, here's another in chapter set of questions. And we continue downward. Open devices. So I said before, open devices are devices that really put, get data out of the computer. And they have two types, hard copy and soft copy. Miss Golding, Miss Golding. I'm yes, talking sir. for a while now. All right, could you give me one hard copy device that you know about? Hard copy. You ever heard the term hard copy before? Yes, sir. When you hear hard copy, what, what comes to mind? Uh, just tell me about what comes to your mind. Don't worry about being right or wrong. Get the answers. Get the, get the questions wrong now. But don't get them wrong later. Hello? Sir, like the, um, the keyboard, sir. Hard copy. Yeah, I think you're probably getting mm -hmm. it mixed up with the hardware. Hard copy devices refer to open devices. Hard copy devices put information on paper, like a printer, um, like a plotter, um, even microfiche, some person might consider a microfiche a hard copy device. So a hard copy device is only an open device. It gets data out of the computer, all right? And for this examiner, they classify open devices under three categories. You have printable devices, Audible device, sound output, print output devices, and print, visual, and sound. Those are the three. So print output, put information on paper. Of course, audio output, sound, refers to speakers and so on. And the third um, visual refers to like um, a TV, a monitor, a projector, those things that display images. Usually some kind of screen light device uh, that, gets in, that gets visual images out. That's how they are classified here. All right. So all open devices, however, the whole category of open, open devices are of two types. Either it's soft copy or it's hard copy. Because all visual and audio output devices, they are considered as soft copy devices. Anything on a screen, on a monitor, on a projector, those are called soft copy. Anything that is on paper, uh, like on a plotter, a plotter really prints those large blueprint drawings or microfiche, so they can actually touch the paper. 
And that is considered a hard copy. All right. And they get into like screens, discussing like monitors and so on. And LCD is a liquid crystal displays. And LED is light emitting diode. And you have newer technology, new, new technological like OLED, which is organic light emitting diode, which are much better than regular LED. So LCD and LEDs are like the flat panel devices, flat screen TV, those things, all right? And so forth. They're all display devices use what is called a pixel, a little dot on a screen, but there are millions of them on a regular device. Little dot on a screen in an area, very small area, like you have a few hundred or a few thousand in an area. It's called a pixel, a little dot. Each dot is called a pixel, and the more pixels you have, the clearer or better the image will show. All right. The pixel is a, is a short name for the word or the phrase picture element. All right. So, picture element, words combined, called, they call it pixels. All right. And RGB is red, green, blue. All right, Miss Preston, the correct me last night about this about, and I forgot, to, I was so busy, I forgot to look up on it about um, primary colors of light and primary colors of something else. I need to really look up that because I did not know that it's something must be really new since me left school, which could be I left, I left high school when 1993, long years ago. So any number of things would change now. All right, so. RGB is red, green, blue, but um, I, was, I was getting mixed up with second primary colors, but I was corrected on that last night. And I really appreciate that, Miss Preston. So I have something to go find. All right. Printing devices. All right. Those are printers, and printers come in two types impact and non impact. What, what do you think a printer would impact, um, Miss Golding? When you have impact to touch something, what would a printer need to touch to create output? Sorry, we might need to touch. All right, what, what would a printer need to touch to have output, to create output? What do printers really use? Ink. Use ink, yeah, but the ink do, goes where? Where does the ink go? On what? On? On the, the ink, hard copy. On the paper, hard copy, yeah. <laughs> So, why you really sound like a sleepy a sleep more time? I'll call you more time. Let me make you read to my topic then. I really sound like you're asleep, Miss, Miss Golding. So, the Miss Preston, if you want to add, add anything you want to add, if you're there, if you want to add or subtract, fine, you can unmute and chime in when you're ready. So, impact printers, it speaks to what? Touching the paper to create images on the paper. That's what impact printer does. A non-impact printer does not need to touch the paper to create output, all right? In other words, impact is to touch. Non-impact means it doesn't need to touch the paper. So there's one impact printer that is listed called a dot matrix printer. It touches the paper to produce output on the paper, all right? And the non-impact printers are like laser printer, inkjet printer, and thermal printer. Thermal printers aren't so common much anymore, but they are, people use them a little bit. I um, mean, like little receipt sheets that you get from supermarkets sometimes, like the Ponacilla machines, that use more about that thermal um, technology. All right. Um, -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -da -da. You have 3D printers that use ink, to, uh, not using ink, sorry, that uses plastic to create images, all right? They are kind of expensive right now, but I guess as more people use them, 
the technology will become more and more refi refined. 3D printers, um, plotters print large architectural diagrams um, for buildings or for large engines or machines and vehicles or ships and planes. Those are printed using a um, plotter. All right. Um, let's go about audio devices again here and so on. Any device giving out sound is an audio device. And some in chapter questions again. We move on beyond quest page 18. I'll come back to this thing primary memory. Now, primary memory or memory, as it's called, then you turn primary memory, think memory. That is where you have RAM and ROM. RAM is what, or is where, I should say, any program they are currently using, that's where it is stored up into RAM. That's simply where it goes. So if I were to open um, Excel, if I click on Excel here, Excel will load up into RAM. The computer would copy bits and pieces of the program, all right, and load that into RAM so that the CPU can get to access it at high speeds. All right, so that is what RAM does. RAM read only memory directs the computer how to boot. How to, booting means starting up. It directs the computer telling the computer how to boot up. That's what ROM does. All right. Um, so that's RAM and ROM. And you have hybrid memory. All right. So this now is where you have like thumb drives being used because it's the same kind of technology as RAM and ROM where it is, where electrical impulses flash information into the circuit, into a little circuit board inside the, the device. But the thing with memory or RAM is that it's volatile. Volatile meaning as soon as light goes away, whatever is in RAM is gone. ROM, however, is not like that. All right. Um, when, no, I shouldn't tell you that enough. Um, because ROM will erase data, but in today's and for many, many years now, it goes back to the manufacturer settings. All right. So if the manufacturer had a date, let's say you buy a laptop five years ago and the manufacturer had a date saying that the laptop date was, let's say, the 9th of September 2017, it will always go back to that date. If you take out the battery that's inside it, it will go back to that date. So it won't really lose the data, it'll go back to that date. All right. So what they have done now is that they use a the thumb drive technology and how they get that is by combining the permanent storage of ROM with the speed, not really full speed, but the technology of ROM wherein you can actually flash electrical impulses into it to read and write data, writing as a store, reading as to retrieve data. And data is represented by using binary digits that's a bit all right so a bit means binary digit that's a zero or a one all right it's a binary digit okay and eight bits make a byte and this now be when when being stored it goes like this eight bits Eight bits make a byte. And then you have 1,000 bytes make a kilobyte. Then 1,000 kilobytes make a megabyte. A megabyte is 1 million bytes or 1,000 thousand. 1,000 megabytes is 1 gigabyte, which is 1,000 million is 1 billion. So really 1 billion bytes is a gigabyte, or I can say 1,000 million. One terabyte is 1,000 billion, all right? So that is what, how it works out to be. 1,000 billion, sorry, 1,000 million makes 1 billion bytes. They're about, not exactly that, but somewhere around that um, figure. Never exactly that figure. So when you hear, 
that you have a 16 gig thumb drive. What you're basically saying is that you have a thumb drive that can hold 16 billion bytes. That's what you're saying. If you have a four gig thumb drive, you have a thumb drive that can hold four billion bytes. Really? That's what it really means. Okay. All right. Um, so that's what memory is. All right. RAM, but all memory store information with the same convention bytes, gigabytes, um, terabytes, trillion bytes. That's a trillion bytes or a thousand. They all use the same convention, whether memory or storage. When you hear bytes, megabytes, think of storage capacity, like how big is your filing cabinet, your refrigerator, or your warehouse. When you hear hertz, megahertz, gigahertz, or so on, think speed, the speed of the processor. That's really what it refers to. All right. Um, devices and media. All right. Miss Golding, you know about cassettes and tapes? You know about VCR tapes and cassettes? Back in the day? Yes, sir. Hmm? Yes, sir. All right, cool. So a tape really is where you can store data. But the thing with that tape, as you, as you might have remembered, is that you have to actually access the data in the order it was stored. So if you, if you want sound number six, or song number four, or song number three, or song number seven. You have to actually go through the songs before that. You have to fast forward before the, to the songs before that. All right, or rewind. So you have to access, access the data in the order it was stored. That is the issue with tapes. But now when you have others like CD-ROM or DVD or Blu-ray or hard drive and so on, you can access the data in any order. It doesn't matter it was stored. You can access the data, all right? <clears throat> So local storage is what you call storage that is on the computer or in the computer, I should say. That's what local storage is. Now you have external storage, thumb drive, and DVDs or CDs, you can just eject it and go on with it, or plug out the thumb drive and go on. What they call external storage. Or a tape, you can just unplug it, eject it via USB or whatever the case may be, and go on with it. All right? Um, these, as I said before, these are not areas that the exam and that exams come much on. You know, I mean, it's not really heavily tested, but we'll go through it so you can actually get an idea of what it's about. Um, CD-ROM, Blu-ray, DVD, all those are actually called optical discs, meaning that you use light to read the data. And in some cases, to write it as well, as in light technology, because laser actually means light. You know, laser was an acronym before. So, but laser means light. So basically, um, you use the light to read and write data to the device. All right. Um, what else? Um, flash memory, flash memory. And the SIM cards and all of those things use the same technology like RAM and ROM, electrical impulses, impulses to read and write data into the device. Let's say like this is called SD card here, or like a thumb drive here. Cloud-based storage refers to storing information on the internet. There's a cloud-based storage. So as you hear cloud or cloud processing or cloud storage, think about internet. That's what cloud is. All right. Um, you can go through this table when you have some time. It's fairly simple. All right. Um, there's a noisy car coming in my direction. I can hear it. You don't even get close to me yet, you know. You soon hear it loud and clear. All right. I don't see the need for much emphasis on CDs and DVDs because these are already obsolete technology, CDs and DVDs. It's already obsolete. You know, more, a lot of young people nowadays don't even know. The average grade, well, maybe, maybe grade seven child also would know, but most, a lot of kids nowadays in school, primary school, they don't even know what, really what CD and DVD is. I mean, that's, that's just obsolete right now. That's already outdated. All right. Um, an operating system, again, I'll come back to this. You have operating systems such as 
Android, for tablets, um, even for little laptops and like Chromebooks, um, for phones, you have Mac OS X because an operating system. What is an operating system again, um, Miss Golding? Remind what, what remind me what an operating system is. Miss Golding, I'm here talking to myself. What is an operating system again? I don't remember. Tell me. There's a system software. System software that does what? It actually, actually controls the whole system of the computer, the whole computer itself. Right, good. It controls the whole computer, hardware and software alike. All right. It does all of these things. Memory management, as in handle how data is goes into, into the memory or the RAM and gets it out as well, make space for new data coming in. Input output management. For example, a driver, as you see here, is a small program that tells a computer how to use a particular hardware device, or a printer, scanner, or so on, or a camera. So a driver is a small program that directs a computer um, as to how it should use the particular hardware. Um, we went through utility software already. Booting done by the ROM chip, that era, that era of memory, that tells the computer how to start up, carries out the whole startup procedure, checks for every single hardware connected to the computer to see what is there before it starts to start up the computer. Um, that's basically that. Um, that's basically what, what operating systems do. Yes. Booting now are like similar to reboot. Yeah, but reboot is like oh. a computer already start up, already restarted. So rebooting is the same thing as saying restarting the computer or booting, starting up the computer. So booting and the, the process, all those steps the computer goes through to start up and so that we can begin to start using it. Batch processing is a way of, is a way of processing data. That means at the end of the day, the week, a fortnight or a month or a quarter, where now you collectively process all the stuff together, do everything together. You, say, you keep all the transactions and then they just do all the calculations one time and just say, okay, this is what you owe. JP is going to send you a nice fat bill or NWC or credit card company or the bank or whoever, or your peer, peer rules and so on. Those are called batch processing. So all the hours that you work, all of those things, they do it at the end of a week, a fortnight, or a month, or so on. That's what we call batch processing. All right? Mm -hmm. Online processing really means that you process while you're connected to the network. That's really what it means. Online, offline means you're processing while you're not connected. But online processing normally facilitates something called real-time processing. That means as soon as you do a transaction, it is processed same time. When you're buying plane tickets, I go to the bank and use the ATM, stuff like that. Sometimes it occurs in real time. As soon as I withdraw the money, the, it comes out the account same time. All right, that's sometimes what you call online process, um, real time processing. There's another one called transaction processing. It occurs by itself, but sometimes later on in the day or in the night. All right. Um, time sharing means that. You have different time sharing. Imagine you are at an internet cafe and it's really full. And you go there and sometimes people tell us you have to wait a few minutes till someone comes off the computer. That's an example of time sharing because there are programs where you have limited computer resources. Programs have to wait their turn. A program or an application has to wait their turn before they can access the CPU or the computer resources to get their processing done. So time sharing really deals with. All right, data transfer. Uh, I'm going to deal with this. We'll deal with the networks because it's kind of it's kind of haphazard. I deal with it here, and I'm going to deal with it again later on about data transfer. Um, primarily dealing with the internet, but still kind of processing talking about graphics, music, and video. 
this is the way that we look at it now. Um, for many years now, graphics refers to JPEG files or PNG or GIF, the way how the picture files are compressed. So you can send them online or I can keep up less space online. And it's easier to send. All right. Music files are called MP3. So MP3 really is a way you compress music files so that it can be easily transmitted over the internet or stored. Simple, easy way. But MP3 really refers to music. MPEG refers to video. MPEG-4 is the latest version. They have MPEG-3, MPEG-2, and an MPEG. Those are motion pictures. So you have moving pictures like a movie, pictures like a movie, and then still pictures like regular taking a picture. All right. Um, these programs, WinZip and Rin, RinWar and so on. Let's imagine like you're going for a weekend and you have like you have your backpack or your weekend bag. I have a lot of stuff you want to put in it so you can push them down and float all the spaces. That's like an example of a zip file. It makes sure you use up every single area of a storage device so it can fit as much information as possible. So like you compress the file. That's really what RINWAR and WinZip does. They are file compression software. All right. Some of the last ones you're coming to is um, different types of software. You have general purpose general purpose customized, you have customized, you have special purpose, and you have integrated. Those are the five types. I will use an example to explain them first of all. When you go to the store, you buy a shirt or a blouse, that's general purpose. Can anybody your size is going to buy it and fit them? That's general purpose. So when you go to the store and you buy one software, one program, even one game, that is general purpose software. Anybody can just buy it and use it right away. When you have someone know, when they go to a, a tailor or a dressmaker, in your case, and they make the dress specifically for your dimensions, your waistline, your hip, or so on, and your, the, the height of your body, that now is what we call customized software. Customized software is particularly made just for you. But sometimes you can have to you can have general purpose customized. You buy the software, but you have little tweaks you want to do it you are able to modify the program so it better fits exactly your needs. All right, that's what we call general purpose customized. So customized software is written just for you. All right, general purpose is buy it off the shelf and it works. General purpose customized when you buy general, general purpose software, but then you modify it slightly. Specialized purpose, soft, special purpose software, specialized purpose is now wherein you have to be trained in a particular industry to know to use the software properly. Like AutoCAD is one very popular one. If you're not trained in building buildings and drawing blueprints and so on, it's not easy for you to use an AutoCAD software. If you're not a mechanic, you can't use, let's like say, Mitchell On Demand or a certain software like that. If you're not an accountant, you can't use accounting software like Peachtree or Quicken or QuickBooks. It's going to be difficult for you to use because you're not trained in that industry. That's what specialized special purpose software is. Integrated software um, means one program they open up and the program has different sub programs underneath it that you can use. And you normally find this in supermarkets and um, merchandising stores. You have you open a program, you have one part the cashiers can use, the other part, somebody in stock room I use, they can see how much shoes gone already, or a particular type or color, or dresses, or hats, or pants. So they can reorder more. It keeps abreast or aware of the current stock levels. The cashier will use one part to buy and sell the stock, point of sale. The accountant in the back room, I use the software to record the transactions and how much money is being made. So this, this singular software have different branches to it. I don't like the fact, and I'm particularly adamant about this, Microsoft Office is not integrated software. If they ask you, put it on the exam, we can tell it in the book. But it is not integrated software. It's called a software suite. They work; to, they can work together, but each program is separate. Integrated software is where you open the software. I have different tabs. Like this is an assignment I was doing for somebody, and then this one is the textbook. Um, you have I have different parts to the same program. That is what integrated software is. 
You open one big program and the program has other subparts to it. All right. Um, so they call it software package, don't so it is a it is a software package or software suite, but definitely not to be used as an example for integrated software. All right. Um, what else? Software interfaces. Software interface really talks about programs that allow you to interact with the computer a particular way. How can you interact with the computer? This one that we're using now is called graphical user interface. Because you can see images like you want to print it. So look at a printer icon here, you can go and click on print or something like that. You want to zoom, you have the plus sign, make your zoom in bigger or minus smaller. Which one you want? The garbage bin here means you want to delete the file. So you use it. So graphical user interface, with the last one first down here, is where you have images that tells you exactly what you can do. By clicking on it, it executes a particular task for you. Menu driven is where you have like these menus, but imagine them with just the words and no pictures. That like a menu driven, you select from the options on the screen without the pictures. The one that says command line interface is this one as a black screen. All right. A black screen where you just type exactly what you want. All right. I showed this to the guys last night. You have to be able to type in your command. You have to, sorry, dir slash p. You have to know exactly what you want. I mean, it doesn't work unless you know exactly what commands you want to use. All right. So that is how command driven interface, command um, line interfaces work. You don't need a mouse or use a keyboard. You don't use a mouse any at all. All right. And we'll do it menu driven already. Windows is more of a graphical user interface, graphical user because you have pictures there like icons and so on. And it's like pointers and pointing devices, true. And then you have types of computer systems. Winding it down to the end now. Uh, which page are we? 33 or going to 34. You have types of computer systems. Now, types of computer systems really deal with like supercomputers and mainframes and mobile devices and PCs. A PC is a desktop machine like at school or a laptop. We, regular individuals, use PCs. Supercomputers are used by large or big companies. Our governments like hurricane tracking, you know, our storm or weather forecasting. You want to fly go to the moon or fly go to Mars, those kind of things. That's what supercomputers use for huge calculations, or you're designing a, a new airplane and you want to see how it reacts in the wind or to fly or so on, how much thrust you need to get that 10 or 20 ton aircraft off the ground or so on. That is what you use a supercomputer super for. Mainframes the processes, calculations, but really it's designed to manage networks, like in banks or big companies, to manage other computers. That's what a mainframe is used for. Mobile devices, we know those. Calculators, phones, tablets. Yeah, small computers. Even a smart watch is a mobile device. All right? Um, an embedded computer, it's like a washing machine or a smart TV or so on, or a car, wherein you control the machine. And based upon what you're doing with the machine, the machine directs the computer, this computer that is in it, the computer chip that's in it. So you use the remote to press buttons and so on, but the TV really controls the computer that's inside of it. All right? You're driving the car, you know, you're pressing the gas really fast, you're through the gas pedal suddenly, then it does pick up the fuel from in the in, from the, uh, uh, the fuel tank and start squirt huge amount of fuel into the engine so the car can actually accelerate faster. Same is true if you decide to slam on the brakes, they want to stop quickly or suddenly. Then now the car, the, the computer is designed to know that, hey, guess what? You want to stop suddenly, you slam on the brakes, so guess what it does? It controls the pistons, the calipers on the, on the brakes to contract very rapidly at an intense rate 
So therefore, the car can stop quickly. All right? So the computer helps to control the car uh, in that respect. That's an embedded computer because you can interact with the computer. The computer is controlled by the machine in which you are in control of. It's an indirect control system. All right. Um, what else? The final thing is troubleshooting. You know, simple computer stuff. You send a document to print, but you won't print. Maybe there's no paper in the in the in the printer. Maybe the ink finish. Maybe it's not plugged in. Maybe it's not connected to your computer. So go into the step to figure out exactly what's wrong. You, you try to pour on the computer and it's not coming on. Maybe the battery is dead if it's a laptop. You need to plug it into charge or it's, if it's a desktop computer is not plugged in. All of those different things is what you call basic computer troubleshooting. The sequence of steps you go to to try and figure out what's going on, why it's not printing or not pouring on or something like that. That most of us do from day to day. All right? You know, basic steps to go through to try and figure out exactly what's going on with the computer, what's wrong with it. All right? They expect you to know that as well. But we're going to dig into this a little bit more. Um, coming to chapter two. We're going to answer all the in-chapter questions. I think this chapter one has about eight sections with in-chapter questions. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, could be more, huh? eight, come to think of it, nine, uh, 10, oh, uh, 11, 11, all right? So 11 sections within chapter questions that we have to go through for next class. Even if we don't get to the chapter two, I want us to go through these in chapter questions to get a feel I was going to spend the time and read through. Don't read to try and memorize anything. Try to understand. Once you understand, remembering takes care of itself. It's a lot easier to remember. All right? So that's what we're going to be doing. End of chapter questions next class. I think that's what we're going to spend the whole next class. And end of chapter questions and the in-chapter questions before we move on to chapter two. Because chapter two kind of short. So... Hopefully next class, we can discuss chapter two and get to the in-chapter activities and end of chapter activities as well during that time because we might run out of time if we do it that way. Come the month of May, we're going to spend all of our time or most of it working on past paper questions. That's what we're going to be doing. All right, any questions, Miss? Um,